Felix Salmon explains the mighty rolling breaker. Ah, to be a surfer on that wave. That is Netflix's share value over the past 18 months in a fashion that's simultaneously pity and horrifyingly empty. Netflix was for a very long time a steamroller, which would just fly on anybody who tried to short it, until the shorts went away, bruised, bloodied, and beaten. Without short interest, there was almost nothing keeping Netflix stock in the realm of sanity. But then the stock started falling, and all those dynamics were reversed. In a normal company with some kind of short interest, a falling stock price is met with shorts taking profits and supporting the price. In this case, the shorts were few and far between, and they too were enjoying the momentum trade. They weren't covering. Indeed, short interest started going up rather than down. All the momentum traders who were happy making money on the way up were equally happy to try to make even more money on the way down. Essentially, the stock price became a freelance entity divorced from any semblance of corporate fundamentals. For such an entity, when the price is rising, more people buy, driving the price up. When the price is falling, more people sell, driving the price down. There is no equilibrium and no underlying value. Question, how many other stocks exhibit similar properties? Relatedly, at least as seen from my paranoid brain, Chris Ellis and John Fender, economics professors from the University of Oregon and the University of Birmingham, respectively, have a brief summary today of their new paper in the economic journal titled Information Cascades and Revolutionary Regime Transitions. We use the idea of information cascades to develop a, a theory of political regime change brought about by the occurrence or threat of revolution. An information cascade speaking loosely, is where people make decisions on the basis of their observations of other people's actions. According to the analysis in our study, workers decide whether or not to rebel by observing other workers' behavior, as well as by observing any signal that they may receive about the state of the regime. So if some people rebel, others may follow, thinking that their rebellion may be a sign of the regime's weakness. If enough of them rebel, there is a successful revolution, and the rulers are overthrown. The model can explain why revolutions are often a considerable surprise to virtually everyone, spectator, er, participants and spectators alike, something that is clearly applicable to the currently unfolding events of the Arab Spring, where there are information cascades both within and between countries. The authors add, we have not mentioned the role of such cascades in the financial crisis, but undoubtedly such cascades are important for many of the events of the crisis, and more generally, maybe important for the stock market. Today, the 17 leaders of the Eurozone countries are meeting to try to prevent a cascade imparting negative information about the value of government debt in southern European economies. While we wait to see whether or not leaders can come to a comprehensive agreement, European stock markets are holding essentially flat, as is the spread on yields between Italian and German 10-year bonds. If leaders fail to come up with an agreement, we're likely to see those spreads jump up again as they did in August. Traders will test the waters to see whether they can break the European Central Bank's half-hearted commitment to keeping spreads low by repurchasing bonds in the secondary market. If some traders successfully short Italian debt, others will follow their example and prices will plummet. Where else are the masses of people making decisions on the basis of their observation of other people's actions? Six weeks ago, people started camping out to protest various inequities of economics and government in New York City. That led other people to camp out in Boston, and London, and Amsterdam, and about 100 other cities around the world. Does this add up to anything? I'm not really sure. Once you boil the fancy term information cascade down to people imitating each other's behavior, it doesn't look like much of an insight. Still, it does look like changes in information technology are leading to more rapid coalescence of these types of herd behavior, and that this is leading to a more unified global society in which there are more positive feedback loops, fewer natural checks on self-exacerbating mass phenomena, and the lower probability that things in any given sphere will tend towards an equilibrium rather than cycling wildly between various creative and or disastrous extremes. This is an article titled Information Cascades, written by MS on October 26, 2011, in the Democracy in America 
which is in the economist blog. Following the loss of visionary Apple co-founder Steve Jobs, President Obama released this statement. Michelle and I are saddened to learn of the passing of Steve Jobs. Steve was among the greatest of American innovators, brave enough to think differently, bold enough to believe he could change the world, and talented enough to do it. By building one of the planet's most successful companies from his garage, he exemplified the spirit of American ingenuity. By making computers personal and putting the internet in our pockets, he made the information revolution not only accessible, but intuitive and fun. And by turning his talents to storytelling, he has brought joy to millions of children and grown-ups alike. Steve was fond of saying that he lived every day like it was his last. Because he did, he transformed our lives, redefined entire industries, and achieved one of the rarest feats in human history. He changed the way each of us sees the world. The world has lost the visionary. And there may be no greater tribute to Steve's success than the fact that much of the world learned of his passing on the device he invented. Michelle and I send our thoughts and prayers to Steve's wife, Lorene, his family, and all those who loved him. And that was from, that was President Obama on the passing of Steve Jobs. Why so many ambitious men and so little, little lofty ambition are to be found in the United States of America? The first thing that strikes a tra traveler in the United States is the innumerable multitude of those who seek to emerge from their original condition. And the second is the rarity of lofty ambition to be observed in the midst of the universally ambitious stir of society. No Americans are devoid of a yearning desire to rise, but hardly any appear to entertain hopes of great magnitude or to pursue very lofty aims. All are constantly seeking to acquire property power and reputation. Few contemplate these things upon a great scale. And this is more surprising as nothing is to be discerned in the manners of, or laws of, of America of America to limit desires or to prevent it from spreading its impulses in every direction. It seems difficult to attribute this singular state of things to the equality of social conditions. For as soon as that same equality was established in France, the flight of ambition became unbounded. Nevertheless, I think that we may find the principal cause of this fact in the social condition and democratic manners of of the Americans. And this was um, volume two, section three, chapter 19 in Democracy in America. So as the Chicago Humanities Festival mold the state of American news media on Wednesday night, the Republican presidential candidates faced off on the economy. Together with the research out of the University of Chicago, the events helped me clarify a significant misconception. Perhaps it's not media fragmentation that polarizes a culture. Our nemesis may be ignorance. At the festival, Clara Jeffrey, a co-editor of Mother Jones Magazine, interviewed David Carr, an incisively idiosyncratic media writer for the New York Times. The interview avoided the often self-important toper of such discussions and provided an entertaining hour. The assembled were a typical festival audio audience, hyper-caffeinated, engaged, and probably left of center polit politically. It was not a leap to interfere there and at a s subsequent mo Mother Jim's fundraiser that we are indeed increasingly and imperiously drawn to news media that reaffirm our personal ideologies. But maybe that potent premise was, is wrong. It's certainly brushed aside in ideological segregation online and offline. A research paper by Matthew Genskow and Jesse 
Shapiro of the Booth Bus School of Business at the University of Chicago. They analyzed data on both online and non-internet news consumption and face-to-face -face social interactions and concluded that there is far less ideology-driven news consumption than, than we assume. The origin of the paper was a sense that the conventional wisdom was wrong. Mr. Getz, Getzkow said in an interview, we had looked at a survey at survey evidence a few years ago, and there seemed to be less segregation than you'd think. So we asked if we could get data good enough to document the extent to which it's true. Their handiwork openly challenges the view that Cass Sunstein, a prominent legal scholar and former university colleague who runs the White House Office of Information and Regulatory Affairs,